Good morning, I'm Tom Fisher and it's my pleasure to see you all here. Unfortunately, I have to give this presentation. The uh, speaker who was originally scheduled is Li Hengjie, David, who's a student of mine. And unfortunately, he wasn't granted a visa to get here in time. And he's terribly disappointed that he cannot be here and asked me to convey his regards to you. And hopefully he can make it to a future ASC conference. I'm running a research group called the Design Cybernetics Group, which is interesting and growing. And I hope I'll have a chance to show more of the work that my colleagues and I are doing in there. This is going to be the first one, and I'll be talking about the concept of non-triviality and how that has been turned into physical objects for demonstration and how I've collaborated not only with David but also with André Cretu who's sitting in the back over there to uh, investigate that story and follow up on it. My presentation consists of two parts. One is my collaboration with André, the second part is my collaboration with David, and in both cases, I am very much indebted to these collaborators without whom none of this would have been realized. A word of warning to begin with, this is Ross Ashby's so-called Ashby box. Has any one of you had a chance to interact with this box? It's in the BCL collection in the University of Illinois. This is the forerunner of Heinz von Furster's concept of the non-trivial machine. Heinz von Förster basically took this machine and translated it into a diagram and into a narrative to convey his idea of non-triviality. The machine was made by Ashby while Ashby was working at the BCL in the 1960s to 70s. And it's been in the possession of the lab until it was resolved. After it was resolved, Ricardo Uribe became the custodian of this box. And I have visited Ricardo before he died a couple of times and he gave me the opportunity to interact with it. And the idea is basically you flip the switches and you cannot predict the two lamp, two bit pattern that's going to change every time you flip a switch. And I'll talk a little bit more later about how this fits into a greater narrative, but the idea is that there are limits to our facility to observationally determine systems because they can very quickly become transcomputational or have such a vast number of internal states that co-determine their output along with our inputs that we are completely helpless if we try to reliably predict the behavior of such machines. That's the essence of non-triviality. And I asked Ricardo whether he could hand me a screwdriver and I First, I asked him, do you ever open it? And he says, yes, every once in a while I open it when it needs a drop of oil. It was kind of a suggestion that there's something electromechanical going on inside. And I said, well, please give me a screwdriver. I want to see what Ashby did. And he said, no, no one gets to look inside the machine. And I, there is a continuity there to also Heinz von Förster and his, the ethos he had as a magician to not reveal other magicians' tricks. So to Heinz and to Ricardo, it was very important that this piece and the performance of interacting with it stays a black box to the user. I've worked on this for a couple of years with uh, Andre, and neither Andre nor I have ever opened this machine. We don't know what is inside, but we have together whitened this black box. We have our own hypothesis for what's inside. And in this presentation, I'll be talking about that. And I just want to give you a fair warning, there is a risk of disenchantment. And if you don't want to know what might be in this box, because we might be right, this is a good moment to leave the room. Yeah, don't, don't be angry with me later, because I'm going to share some speculation with you. Uh, and the reason why I think this is okay is we have created remakes of this machine, and knowing everything that's going on inside, I can still interact with it and I can still not predict it. Yeah, I know how it works, but that doesn't mean that the next time I flip a switch, I can predict the pattern. So in that sense, even to me, when I am not the designer of the box, when I'm the user of the box, even if it's open, it's still a black box. That's why I think it's okay to share these things. The background of this is that a couple of years, I have noticed a very strange isomorphism between the Enigma cipher machine that the Nazis used to uh, encode their U-boat and other military communications in the Second World War, and a box that Ashby built 
back in the UK before he joined the BCL called Ashby's Black Box. This is not the Ashby Box, this is another device that he built earlier. And the Enigma machine, as you see here, maybe some of you are familiar with this. It has a keyboard and it has a field of lamps. It has a plug board where you can sort of mix the, the, the circuitry inside. And up there, there are three cylinders that have random wiring inside. A later naval version had all of these rotors to make it more secure. And when you press a button, the machine does two things. Number one, it immediately closes a circuit. The signal comes from a battery, travels through the keyboard, goes into the rightmost cylinder or rotor, as it's called, and the rotor has 26 contacts in a, arranged in a circle on one side and 26 on the other side, but random wiring inside. So it passes from the first to the second to the third. Then there is a return wiring where 13 wires cross over randomly and the signal comes out again. This results in a symmetry that basically means, number one, whenever you press a letter, it will never be transcoded into itself. When you press A, there will never be A lighting up. It's always going to be another letter. And that's a cryptographic weakness, but it's a practical strength because with this symmetry in military application, the sender and the receiver of a message can use the same machine with the same initial setting to encode and to decode a message. That's uh, basically how this works. And so the second thing that happens after you press the button and it closes the circuit, when you release the button, then mechanically it rotates the rightmost rotor. And after the rotor has made 26 steps and it's basically done its 360 degrees, the next rotor will also move by one step. It's a little bit like a mechanical mileage counter in a car. So every time you interact with it, the machine will turn into a different machine to encode the next letter. So we have a set of input contacts, output lamps, rotational reconfiguring of contacts, and a pipeboard. In Ross Ashby's black box, we have four input switches for uh, output lamps, we have a pipeboard for rewiring, and we've got a hand crank on the side with a rotational switch that he built. So I was very intrigued by this isomorphism between these two devices, and together with Andre, we've developed a larger narrative to contextualize this in the history of machines, where we hypothesize how this machine has come into existence. There's no time for me to go through this entire story. We've written this up as, a, I think, a really nice chapter. And it starts with the idea of four terminal networks being mentioned in Norbert Wiener's Cybernetics and having been discussed at a meeting at the hospital where Ross Ashby worked in the UK. Walter Gray was there and a couple of other people and they were talking and Norbert Wiener mentioned that at MIT they are talking about this concept of four terminal networks where you've got two inputs and two outputs. You don't know what's in the middle, but the machine is doing funny things that you don't like in communications. Yeah? This could be an undersea cable, this could be a radio link, and if there are capacities or inductancies or all kinds of weird things going on, you have to see what is going wrong and you have to kind of debug this circuit as an engineer. How do you debug a system when you can't look inside? Then there was Alan Turing's work on cracking the Enigma codes after the Second World War, Ashby built first the black box, then the homeostat, which is using similar technology inside as we believe was then used in the Ashby box, specifically uniselector rotational switches. And then he built the Ashby box after joining the BCL, and then at BCL, Heinz von Förster abstracted the concept into his non trivial machine. And there are various bits of history that kind of corroborate this, uh, this lineage of ideas. Ashby having met Wiener, Alan Turing was bound by the National Secrets Act to never talk about his uh, cryptographic work at Bletchley Park until he died, but the uh, Nigma machine was public knowledge. It's been patented in Germany in, I think, 1918 and he was free to talk about that. The two were both members in the Ratio Club and they might have talked about this and that might have inspired Ashby to build this device. 
and then of course Ashby and Heinz von Förster were working on these concepts together at the BCL. If you look in various places, including the Understanding Understanding book by Heinz von Förster, Heinz tells a story about how Ashby used the box to confuse his students, basically giving the students the box with the assignment of basically writing down a truth table to predict what kind of input produces what kind of output. Basically, students spent nights having a feeling of immediate closeness. Yeah, I just need to check this thing out for two more seconds, and then I'll, everything will come together, and they never managed to predict this machine. And in the story, Heinz comes back in the morning, or actually Ross Ashby comes back in the morning and tells the students, uh, I'll tell you how many possibilities you have, 10 to the power of 126. And then they relaxed and gave up. So this is a little bit of a giveaway, and this is a, a starting point for the work that Andre and I did. And Andre figured this out. He realized that the transfer function between four inputs and four outputs, that variety allows for 256 transfer functions. And that then poses the question of how do we get from this number of transfer functions to 10 to the power of 126? And we get there by saying, apparently, the machine doesn't implement all the transfer functions, but just a set. And then the question is, how many transfer functions does it implement? And then you can sort of go backwards and say, by what number do we have to raise 256 to approximate 10 to the power of 126? And that's what we did. And the answer is 52. What's 52? And why is it not 42? 52, as it turns out, is a number that shows up in a kind of component called a uniselector, which looks like this. It's been patented in the late 19th century, and it's, if you still remember old rotary phones, the thing that goes do -do 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 that's this thing. It's basically a stepping motor that can, it, it's a very complicated switch that goes in circles. And this is one of them, and it happens to have, it's a type 52 switch, it has 52 positions. I haven't been able to determine why 52. There were some that, have, that go in 10 steps, 20 steps, 30 steps, decimal steps. Makes sense, mathematically we tend to do things in steps of 10. Why 52? There's another one, 26, which is half of 52. Uh, the English alphabet and the Enigma are both based on the number 26. We've got 26 letter in the English alphabet, and the Enigma machine had 26 letters. So this may be a vestige or a sort of remnant from earlier uh, text processing circuitry. This is an advertising for this particular rotary switch that comes from Electronics Magazine in 1949. And I managed to get a new old stock one on eBay, and Andre also got one. And then we thought, let's see what we can do to implement this device. So I got mine from eBay, and the first thing was to basically hook up a rotary dial and to drive it. And this is what I was talking about. This, when you were dialing a number, this is what happens in the, in the telephone switching center. So then the next thing that we need to create an Ashby box is a circuit that basically pulses to drive this machine whenever either one of two toggle switches is switched. And this is a circuit that Andre has developed for this purpose, and here's a little demonstration of it. And this already sounds a little bit like what the, the Ashby box sounded like. So that's the first step. Then we need a whole bunch of transfer functions, and this, you see, 26 transfer functions here that are multiplied by two because there are two ways of hooking up uh, the lamps and the switches. And then we don't use a single changer, but a double th double throw, what, what are they called? Double section switch. Yeah, yeah. So one of them two sections the double throw. throw. It's two changes. Them. Two changes, but so you've got this, but twice in each package. And we use one of them to create the transfer function and the other one to uh, drive the pulser. So every time we flip the switch, it goes to the next position on the UV selector. And that's pretty much it. So when you wire this up, 
it looks like this. Let me quickly show you one thing that is really interesting. It's the very first time it starts, you will see this LED blinking up and then going off very quickly. Just pay, pay attention to that one. This very quick transient on, this happens when the wires are still on the old position, touching the old contacts before it progresses to the next one. The Ashby box has a tiny bit of that as well. I remember that, but it's not as pronounced as this. And the reason is that I'm using LEDs, which are very quick. And the Ashby box has incandescent lamps and they need some time. And before they are full on bright, the white bird is already on the next position. So uh, it's much stronger over here. And here we have a side-by-side -side view of the URI selector. These are the transfer functions that I've sold it on. And this is an old Enigma rotor. And these are the 26 contacts on one side. And there's another set of 26 contacts on the other side. So, and this is Andre's implementation, and this is what it looks like when Andre interacts with it. And it uses uh, incandescent lamps, and you see the slowness of the lamps when they come on. Every time you flip a switch, you have no idea which binary pattern is going to show up on the lamps. Okay, so this is a side-by-side -side view of the original Ashford box and the implementation of Andre. Andre actually would put it in a shell. Mine is still open. I never put it in a shell. But something really interesting happened. After all of that was implemented, I realized there's a very curious detail. When we look at these two screws up here that are also showing up over here, which are a result of the way the uniselector is mounted inside the box. This was not planned, that these screws have to show up in the same place, but they do, apparently out of necessity, and it's a strong indication that maybe something similar is going on in that box. So, why do we care? Once the device was formalized into the non-trivial machine, Heinz von Förster uses this essentially as a social critique. He is lamenting our sort of cultural tendency to trivialize human behavior. And he criticizes the fact that basically the whole of education, and I would also argue professionalism, is us demanding triviality from one another. And one of the points that Heinz von Förster made was he asked people, do you think of yourself as a person as a trivial machine or as a non-trivial machine? And everyone says, of course, I'm a non-trivial machine. I'm not very predictable, I'm very creative. Every time you talk to me, I'm a very interesting and engaging person. But uh, when I go and pick up my coffee, I want the order as I told them. I don't want them to be creative. And hopefully, the waiter or the barista is a trivial machine. And he was talking about a person buying a car, expecting the car to be a trivial machine. And the warranty of a car basically being a certificate, certifying that the car is acting as a trivial machine. And when you roll off the premises of the dealership and the wheel falls off, then all of a sudden it's a non-trivial machine and you have to bring it back to what he calls the trivialisateur, the guy working in the garage who turns it back into a trivial machine. So it behaves as we expect. And a very good example of a trivial machine is a conventional vending machine. You put in a coin, you press the selection, and then there is the same determinable output every time you press the same button. You want to have the same Snickers bar. You don't want some potato chips when you press the button for the Snickers bar. And if it doesn't do that or it doesn't give you anything back at all, then it makes us very upset because we're frustrated, we're not getting from the machine what we want. And that's pretty much also what we do in education, where we teach young human beings to give expected and already established and known answers reliably. And he criticizes that. I don't think he criticizes it entirely, but he criticizes our tendency to 
basically rest all of society on that idea. And maybe there are other aspects to humanity that also need to be taken into consideration, but we don't do that enough. And that's Heinz von Förster's point. And that's what he's basically doing is he is he came up with two narratives. One is the diagram that talks about inner states and inputs and outputs, and it's a very technical narrative. The other one is a story about a teacher and a school child, and the school child responds to the question, what is two times two, with the answer three. These are not entirely the same, but they make the same point. By the way, in the diagram, we have an input, and the input determines a changing internal state, and the output is co-determined by both the input and the internal state. So that combination gives you a very large combinatorial set of possibilities, and that's why it's difficult to determine. And of course, the inner state is hidden because it's a black box. So that's the cultural critique and the wider cultural relevance of this machine in the work of Heinz von Furster. And that's why one of the reasons why this is a very important device. I think there's a second reason why this is a very important device that hasn't been talked about before. When we go back to Turing and the Turing machine, the Turing machine is a thought experiment that Turing proposed to illustrate an answer he gave to Hilbert's Entscheidungsproblem. The question is, what are the limits of deductive reasoning? If you have some premises and some rules and you deduce the outputs of those premises and those rules, what are the limits of deductive reasoning? And he addressed that by presenting a mechanism that can perform this kind of deduction. And I think the Ashby box is a sister to the Turing machine because it shows us the limits of inductive reasoning. Yeah, going from the specific to the general, specific observations and experiences are not enough to induce outputs that can be expected. So if we think about the duality of deductive reasoning and inductive reasoning, those two devices are sisters because one shows the limits of deductive and the other one shows the limits of inductive reasoning. And in that sense, it's a highly profound machine that I think we are not talking about enough. Yeah, let, let, let me just wrap it up by saying the social critique of von Förster is reason enough to fall in love with this device, but there is more that we haven't explored because this device is probably not yet known enough. And then the question is, how do we make it more known? How do we put it into more people's hands? And that's where the question of productizing it keeps coming back. And I have conversations about this with Kenny, who many of you know. This is a sketch she did in 2018, the idea of a small device that could be given into people's hands like, as a little souvenir or as a, a demonstration. So we had this idea for a couple of years. And then when Heng Jie asked me, can I do something in your lab? I said, well, sure, why don't you do this? And everything that follows is the work that he's done. So how have we changed this into a more contemporary reincarnation? The first thing we had to do is get the ergonomics right. Like when you look, this is from an ergonomics paper that basically says if you have manual input elements and you have visual output elements on an industrial panel, you put the visual output on top and you put the manual input at the bottom, otherwise you, your arms are going to block out the lamps. So this is actually ergonomically not how we would do this today. We would swap this around, and that's the first thing that we did. Then the next question was, how small should it be? In fact, like this four pounds of metal is a bit big for a convenient classroom demonstration or a gift or a present for someone. So it could be quite small, but we could make it ridiculously small, and then it would be too small. So what's a good size? And that was driven by us basically going through, there's an electronic market in, uh, in Shenzhen called Hua Changbei where you can go and you can play with all sorts of components. And we picked one switch that in terms of the voltage that it's rated for is complete overkill, but in terms of scale and tactile quality, that was the switch that we wanted to use. So that became a determining factor in the form factor development and when you look at various objects, if objects are supposed to relate to the human hand in a meaningful way, they all kind of end up at that scale. 
So there's no point in making it ridiculously small if you want it to be a nice object in a human head. So that's the scale that we aim for. The end product is basically this. It's uh, two plastic shells, 3D printed, two switches, two LEDs, uh, lithium battery, an ESP32 microcontroller, a daughter board that Hang designed, and then there's also a wrist strap to make it nice. This is the controller. Next question is, how smart? Heng Jie, being a computer science student, was immediately going to the full feature set of this controller. Should it use the Bluetooth function? Should it use the Wi-Fi function? Should it use a, an accelerometer so every time you lift it up, it wakes up? Should there be USB data for different purposes? And I rejected all of that. The idea was for the machine to be as simple and trivial as possible. Nothing about it should suggest smartness. The idea is that it's a very trivial mechanism. The only thing that we did was that when the LEDs go on or off, there's a very short half second subtle fading using pulse width modulation that emulates a little bit the slowness of an incandescent lamp. And we've picked LEDs that have a very warm incandescent glow. I wrote a Python script of what Andre and I implemented. This is the beginning of the C++ version that David Hengje wrote for this uh, controller. And then in terms of form factor development, we were inspired by this kind of device. This uh, classic telephone receiver mimics a semicircle, an arc in an input-output interaction. And there are other devices like this old Panasonic pocket calculator from the 70s where you see the input is sort of protruding out from the device facing the user and the output is doing the same, mimicking that arc in a loop. And that became an interesting inspiration for us as well. And this is the product as it's implemented now. And I can pass them around and you can get lost in it. And that's it. I can, I can show you some more pictures of it. This is the side view. And that's it. until you, the state is both hands off. <laughs> it, it doesn't have an on off switch. Like, like the original. Like the original. And it has a, it, at the bottom it has a USB-C. You, you just charge it with your phone charger. And then it runs for a week. Even if everything of both lamps are off. The most energy draining function of it is actually the pulse width 
modulation to bring the LEDs on and off. That takes a lot of processing time. When that's not happening, the CPU is really, really slow and it's very energy. <coughs> when you think of the original concept, what it basically boils down to is a 4-bit computer with, uh, how much is 416 bits of memory that has one program load on and basically the uh, idea of figuring out the Ashley box is looking through that space of possible programs that a 4-bit computer with uh, 416 bits of memory can have. So that's obviously enormous, right? And, uh, so just, just, just now listening to Andre, you can probably guess what a pleasure it was to work with him on this. There was this one moment, and I have to share this with you, I hope you don't mind. I made that video, flipping the switch and the, the unicycle going chuck, 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 and the lamps go on and off. And within a minute after I sent him the video, he sent me a reply and said, you have a cold soldering joint on position 20. <laughs> That's, that's how his brain works. <laughs> Did you use this in class to inside or...? To be honest, this was not finished two hours before I went to the airport. And I, <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> <laughs> so just experiencing it, you know, when, can you maybe say something about when or why something like this might be experienced as random versus a pattern? I personally do not use the word randomness for the same reason why I'm not using the word complexity, because I'm a constructivist. I either have an explanatory model or not. 